Hello, everyone, and welcome to Women, Deeds, and Dirt, Confront the Climate Crisis, Uproot Gender Inequality, a virtual event exploring the intersections between women's land rights, sustainable land use, and climate change. The U.S. Department of State and Landessa would like to thank the White House Gender Policy Council, our colleagues at USUN and USAID, for their partnership and support in making this important discussion possible. I also wanna note our office's gratitude to Landessa for being fantastic collaborators in facilitating today's event. And my own thanks for our SGWE colleagues and their team, especially Aubrey Paris for helping to organize this event. And of course, to you all watching this event for your interest and dedication in supporting gender equality and equity and combating climate change. My name is Kat Bodovet and I'm the senior official in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the US Department of State and I will be your moderator for the duration of this program. And it's such an honor to be joined by such incredible speakers. As evidenced by the priority theme of this year's Commission on the Status of Women, understanding and acting on the nexus of gender and the climate crisis has never been more critical. It is well established that women and girls are disproportionately impacted by the effects of climate change, but it is equally well established that these same women and girls are some of our most effective leaders and agents of change as we work to combat the climate crisis. We are proud that the US government's first ever national strategy on gender equity and equality was released last October and recognizes this important dynamic by identifying promoting gender equality and equity in mitigating and responding to climate change as one of the top 10 strategic priorities. As we draft our own agency implementation plans, we are actively working to incorporate climate-related goals. We know that issues of land ownership and use affect women's well-being and livelihoods, with critical implications for our ability to adapt and mitigate climate challenges. And that will be the subject of our discussion today. To get us started, I am pleased to share with you a short conversation I recently had with Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, Secretary John Kerry whose championing of gender issues and climate mitigation initiatives provide a perfect introduction to today's conversation. While he extends his regrets for not being able to join us live, he was eager to provide some food for thought to take with us into our panel discussion. Let's take a look. Thank you so much, Secretary Kerry, for joining us in this discussion on women's land rights and land use in the context of the climate crisis. As you know, this is the first year that the Commission on the Status of Women is focusing on a climate environment theme, which we're thrilled about given the emphasis that the Biden-Harris administration has placed on both gender and climate issues over the first year. You have truly been a gender champion throughout the year, so we are so grateful to have your continued leadership and advocacy for women in dealing with climate change. With sincere gratitude for your participation in this fireside chat as another example of you amplifying the need for inclusive efforts, I'd like to jump right in with my first question. For a good reason, a fair amount of attention has been paid to the disproportionate effects of climate change impacts on women and girls around the world. But this isn't the only way we should approach the gender climate nexus. Based on your expertise, as well as your travels abroad, what is the role of women and girls in limiting temperature increase below 1.5 degrees Celsius and promoting climate resilience, particularly related to sustainable land use and adaptation efforts? Well, Kat, first of all, thank you for inviting me to be part of this. I really appreciate it and uh, look forward to our conversation. Um, and uh, appreciate the question very, very much. And, and thank you also uh, to the Commission on the Status of Women, to uh, Landessa Rural Development Institute, which is uh, hosting this critical gathering. And uh, a big thank you to you and your team, Kat, for all that you're doing. Um, and when I say, uh, I mean, it's a big role. I'm not kidding when I say that. It, 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 and I'm not saying it for the benefit of this audience or this particular conversation. Uh, women all around the world, uh, and this is sort of known more and more in more quarters of governance, make a gigantic difference in deliberations where often men have failed, just to put it bluntly, uh, making peace, arriving at agreements, 
uh, building community. I mean, there's so many different components uh, of uh, what different folks bring to the table. And I, I think it's, it's clear uh, that this is really worth focusing on because it makes a difference to each and every one of the things I just said, to building community, to ending conflicts, to working on solutions, and particularly on, on the climate crisis where women already play such an integral role uh, because of the way our societies are structured uh, and the way we live. Uh, I'm delighted that, that, that the commission has really a specific focus this time of this round on uh, women and climate. Uh, it's precedent setting and it, it underscores everything that I just said a moment ago. Uh, there's no question in my mind that uh, women bring different sensitivities to the table and different awareness and different set of responsibilities to any discussion about building a healthier and a cleaner uh, and a safer planet. All of those particular adjectives are pretty important uh, to the ability of women to be able to have an impact. And I think, you know, uh, the Biden administration, I think, is already setting an example for this. Uh, we have Vice President Harris, obviously, Secretary Jennifer Granholm, Secretary of Energy, who was deeply involved on, on these issues. Gina McCarthy, uh, who heads up our domestic initiatives uh, and plays such a key role as an advisor in the White House. Uh, and then, of course, the president of the UNFCCC, uh, Patricia Espinoza. So the list goes on. I mean, there are you know, loads of folks uh, recognizable around the world for the role that they've played and are playing. And of all ages, obviously, I think of Greta Thunberg or Malala. Uh, you know, these are folks who've already had a massive impact and, and set an example. So. President Biden understands and, and has made it clear to everybody working in the administration that we're only going to win this fight if we're all in it together. And that means empowering uh, 50 or 50 plus percent of the world to be able to help make a difference. I used to say to people back in Massachusetts when I was a senator, you know, and I, I used to play a lot of sports. Uh, if you're on a team, you don't you don't ever do very well in, in competition if half half the team is on the bench uh, continually. And, and that's where we've been in most of the world, unfortunately, with respect to people participating in leadership positions um, in, in uh, uh, listening to and learning from people in governance. So the stakes, uh, as we learned just Monday, uh, of the IPCC most recent report. That's the report put out by the top scientists in the world and from all over the world. I think there's 67 countries represented, many women, I might add, scientists and others taking part in that. And they have made it very clear that uh, we're already seeing the devastating impacts of the climate crisis. And, and we're trying to hold the Earth's temperature increase to 1.5 degrees. It's already at 1.2, as we talk today. So we don't have a big cushion to make some very giant decisions. So ultimately, the crisis is an, is an opportunity for us to change our economies, to transform them into much more thoughtful, uh, much more just, and this is a critical component of this transition, is we don't leave people behind uh, particularly women and girls. Uh, we need everybody at the table. I have seen this, uh, the, 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 the changes that are being made and the impact of women in those changes all around the world. I just came back from Vietnam. I was in Cairo. Uh, and I will tell you that women are deeply involved in the uh, deliberations that will lead to the next meeting of the UN in Sharm el-Sheikh in November of this year. But uh, when I was in Vietnam, I, I met with the State Department's young Southeast Asian leaders called YSEALI, a terrific initiative, which is training young women to lead their communities and their countries, uh, including in climate and, and environmental activities. So 
I've just met with a bunch of them and they are adopting sustainable agriculture practices, for instance, uh, planting trees, uh, moving away from charcoal as a fuel source. One of the greatest sources of pollution in the world is the fact that in too many places, people are forced to cook with, with basic charcoal, with coal. And uh, it's, it's a huge emitter. It also makes people sick. It, it's not great for respiratory systems. And it's usually women and girls who are forced into, uh, you know, playing the role of organizing the food and the provisions uh, around uh, uh, the effort to sustain life for, for families. So women make up almost half of the agricultural workforce in the world. And, 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 and if one could, one could engage women uh, in, in undertaking sustainable agriculture practices, we would have a profound impact on retaining carbon and beginning to address uh, the challenges of the climate crisis. And I, I think that, it, you know, it's not an exaggeration to say that if you close the gender gap in agriculture, you wind up generating very significant gains for the agricultural sector and for society because of the practices that would be insisted on uh, in undertaking that work. And output in agriculture is estimated that it might rise by about 4% or so if we were to do that. So um, we also face a huge challenge on forestry. The deforestation in Brazil, the deforestation in the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Southeast Asia and other places is ravaging our forests. And it has a profound negative impact in increasing the carbon dioxide emissions that contribute to the global climate crisis. So women's lives, if you examine them in these various countries, are often interwoven with the forest. And, and it's, it's more often than not, I have seen this personally in countries I have visited uh, all the way from the Middle East through Southeast Asia, that it's women who are often locked out of land ownership and who also locked in to collecting the food and the fuel for their families, or who draw on medicinal plants to heal, uh, and, and they're often called on to sell forest product, pro products. So, uh, you know, it's pretty short-sighted to put ourselves in a place where we're missing the enormous value that fully integrating half the population into the stewardship of our lands would provide. So, uh, you know, let me just wind up here by saying that we know from experience that involving women in the management of forests uh, and other lands also leads to better governance and to uh, uh, fewer conflicts. Uh, so uh, it seems to me that, that if we do a better job of including uh, indigenous women and girls uh, into our decision-making, uh, their knowledge of community needs is absolutely indispensable and would have a profound impact on our addressing many of the challenges that we face, some of which inevitably lead to conflict. So, um, uh, you know, uh, we've learned in the last years that uh, health, the capacity of people to be healthy, and it's often women, much, much more than men who are uh, cognizant of the practices and able to implement them that make a difference with respect to health, and you can't have community without health. Uh, everybody's begun to recognize the reality of health playing a major component of security, uh, of a security role in the building of community and of, of, of country all around the world. So uh, bottom line is we need to, to solve this crisis we face now, we need everybody on deck involved. And it's clear from what I, I hope it's clear from what I've just laid out, there are a myriad of roles women play and can play that if they bring it to the table, we have a much better shot of getting done what we need to get done.
Thank you so much, Secretary Kerry. I really appreciate your points on emphasizing that women must be included and, and having the entire team. Um, they must be included as leaders in, in the climate crisis on agricultural forestry and as in innovators, entrepreneurs, founders of initiatives. I really appreciate those points. Um, you recently rolled out a strategy for climate action in 2022 called the Implementation Plus. As you know, the first U.S. national strategy on gender equity and equality was released in October of last year. I, and it identified promoting gender <laughs> equity in mitigating and responding to climate change as one of 10 strategic priorities. What is the United States doing to better harness the potential of women and girls in the fight to address climate crisis? And how does this fit into the Implementation Plus approach? Well, thanks for asking that, Kat. It's a key question. And uh, let me just say a couple of words before I sort of describe some of the things we're doing. Uh, let me frame the, the question, if you will. Um, we decided in Glasgow at COP26 that, and we moved major countries that have been very reluctant to adopt this, that we really need to work together to try to hold the Earth's temperature increase to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, why are we doing that? Because the scientists are telling us we need to do that. No one in, in our shop or in the US government that I know of is making up policy based on their personal druthers or based on uh, politics or ideology. We are listening, President Biden is listening and he's asked all of us to listen to the scientists to the people on the front lines who are analyzing this and have been for 30 years or more. And they're telling us as a matter of mathematics and physics that bad things are happening to planet Earth because human beings are putting all this junk pollution up in the atmosphere. And if we don't reduce those emissions, it's gonna warm way past 1.5. Currently we're on course to hit 2.7 degrees. That's about where we are now. And uh, the promises that were made in Glasgow, if they're implemented, could actually hold the Earth's temperature increase. At least the, the promises currently on the table would result in holding it to 1.8 degrees by 2050, which is pretty damn good considering where, we, where we've been heading, but only, only if we fully implement. If we don't implement, it's all talk and it's gonna be overtaken by Mother Nature's reaction to what is happening. We're already seeing that reaction with the melting of ice, fires, intensity of storms, floods, sea level rise. I mean, you can run a lot extreme heat uh, and, and, and we're changing the chemistry of the ocean. We're changing our capacity to live on the planet. So it is absolutely vital to get everybody involved in, in dealing with, with, with this challenge. And uh, we need to, 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 to do the things we said we're gonna do. So what we rolled out is a very simple, uh, but demanding goal, which is implement. We gotta implement. We, in our words, it's implement, 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 and then plus. And the plus is bringing the people on board who as of now have not yet been willing to do the things necessary to win this battle. And those are, you know, we have about 20 countries equal 80% of all the emissions. So if we can get those 20 countries, which are the most biggest economies in the world to start implementing, we can win this battle. And we got in Glasgow, we got 65% uh, of all of the economic activity of the world signed up to implement. That means 35% has not yet. And so what we need to do is bring that other 35% on board uh, in order to hold on to the 1.5 degrees. Now, one of the other things we can do is what we promised to do in Glasgow, which is bring women to the table to use that full team. I just talked about it a moment ago. We get the whole team on the field and, and we announced a series of initiatives uh, related to gender and climate. One, we are investing at least $14 million in gender equity and in the Equity Action Fund, which will advance women's leadership in climate action, increase women's uh, 
economic participation and build women and girls resilience to climate shocks and stresses. And one of the things we did in addition was to double the amount of money we're going to put into adaptation, which is helping communities to be able to build the resilience to withstand the hurricane or the cyclone uh, or the typhoon or the, the floods and the things that happen. And women are particularly, obviously, uh, more a part of the fabric of those communities to be able to set the priorities and be able to help allocate uh, those funds in ways that are really going to have meaning. In addition, uh, the U.S. government and the State Department with USAID and uh, DOE uh, and uh, NASA are all working together to advance women's leadership in climate action. And they're going to increase women's economic uh, uh, participation with some $20 million that is going to be invested towards initiative that increases women's economic opportunities in the clean energy sector uh, and beyond. So that it's really front and center in this transition that we're involved in. I might mention that the State Department is also working uh, in East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific to uh, connect women with new career opportunities and uh, to connect women's businesses with new markets. It's amazing with the internet, what a tiny little business, which has access to, uh, to Wi-Fi, can make in terms of marketing. Uh, they're incredible opportunities. Uh, so as we try to adapt to a warmer world, uh, President Biden is committed to work with Congress, and he has put $3 billion on the table for adaptation finance annually for what's called PREPARE, the President's Emergency Plan for Adaptation and Resilience. And, and that will serve as a cornerstone of our adaptation response, and women tend to be on the front lines of those adaptation needs. So we very much look forward to building on the momentum of all of these commitments, uh, including those on gender, gender and climate uh, that were made in Glasgow as we prepare to go on to Sharm El Sheikh in Egypt. And we welcome all of your input, all of your ideas about how to do this in the smartest way, most effective way, and the fastest way. Uh, and, and I think it'll make all the difference in the world. Thank you so much, Secretary Kerry. We are so proud to be on the team with you. And thank you so much for having this important conversation with me today. We are incredibly grateful for your leadership and support related to gender climate nexus, especially in this pivotal and relevant year of the Commission of Status of Women. Thank you again. Thank you, Kat, very much. My privilege to be with you. Take care. Our privilege. Thank you. All right, many thanks once again to Secretary Kerry for lending his dedication to inclusion, expertise and insight into a, a conversation that really sets the stage for the remainder of today's program. It's time for us to launch into our panel discussion on the nexus between land rights and sustainable land use and climate change and gender. For this discussion, we are honored to be joined by four amazing women who are leading in different aspects of this challenge. And their work includes women's empowerment related to land tenure reforms, water, agriculture, and more. Let me please join me in welcoming our panelists, Beth Roberts, Director of the Center for Women's Land Rights at Landessa, Roshan Jahan Moni, Deputy Executive Director of the Association for Land Reform and Development, or ALRD, Jeanette Gurong, Founder and Executive Director of Women Organizing for Change in Agriculture and Natural Resource Management, or WOCAN, and Sydney Gray, Founding Director of Mama Maji. And um, thank you all for joining us today. We are very excited to learn from each of you. To get started, I'd like to invite each of you to provide a brief introduction to you, your organization, and your work. Beth, I'll start with you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Kat. It's a privilege to be here with you and with, with my fellow panelists and with all of our guests today. And a huge thanks to the, the Office of Global Women's Issues for co-hosting this event with us. So as Kat said, I'm Beth Roberts. I'm the director of the Center for Women's Land Rights. Um, for those of you who may not be familiar with Landessa, 
We are a global land rights organization. We've been working from a law and policy angle on, on land rights for about 40 years and securing land rights for uh, the approximately 2.5 billion people, mostly in rural areas that rely on land for a living. And we have had a focus on gender and social inclusion and specifically on women's land rights uh, for about 30 years now. And so I'm privileged to lead our center on women's land rights and our gender and social inclusion work across our organization. So Landessa has work across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia, and um, in, in uh, the Latin American region as well. And um, I am also privileged to lead uh, Landessa's work on the Stand for Her Land campaign, which is in collaboration with a number of land sector actors. Stand for Her Land is a global campaign focused on closing the implementation gap. So closing the gap between the strong standards we have in place for women's land rights at the international, regional, and national levels, and the lack of implementation on the ground. So the 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 social norms that prevent women's land rights from being implemented in practice, as well as the just the lack of implementation that we see around the world. And so we are partnering with the Office of Global Women's Issues to um, implement the campaign in Colombia and Bangladesh. And so I'm pleased to be here with my colleague Moni, who's leading our work in, in Bangladesh as well. And so I'll, I'll stop there. I'll wrap up our, my introduction uh, just on those points and turn it back over to you, Kat. Thanks so much. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much, Beth. And with that, we'll turn to Moni. Moni, I think you need to unmute. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Roshan Jahan Muni, working with Association for Land Reform and Development in Bangladesh. So this is an organization who works on land rights. Uh, this is a single focused organization and having a prime focus on women land rights, particularly the women from marginalized community, indigenous women, coastal women, and landless and poor women, uh, fisher folk also. So um, we are also the part of Landesa um, led uh, project that is the Stand for Harland uh, campaign. Uh, so we are the uh, country led in Bangladesh and we will be implementing three and a half years uh, project here. So we will be focusing on communities to uh, with the objective of the closing the gaps of implementation and the norms and behavioral change and practices. So we are very much looking forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moni. Jeanette? Thank you very much, Kat. Um, hello to everybody. And, and again, thanks for the privilege to be, to be on this webinar with all of you. Um, I am first and foremost, as I like to say, a forester uh, and a gender expert. And I am the founder and executive director of, of WOCAN, as Kat mentioned. WOCAN, for those of you who don't know us, we are a US registered NGO that's a global network with over 1,450 members in about 114 countries. All of us are technical, we have technical backgrounds and expertise in climate related sectors, such as agriculture, natural resource management, forestry, water, et cetera. And our mission is to advance women's empowerment and collective action to tackle climate change, poverty, food insecurity, and create the enabling environments for those sectors. So. In order to do that, we provide capacity building and training for gender mainstreaming, uh, women's leadership, we conduct research, we write uh, gender action plans, for example, for climate uh, change funds, and we provide technical assistance in measuring and monitoring um, how those are going. So we at Wokan were 18 years old and we've worked for almost two decades to integrate and mainstream gender into both public and private organizations that are responsible for agriculture, forestry, and other land use related initiatives. But going beyond capacity building, which we felt was necessary, we developed the W plus standard, which is a standard, it's a certification framework uh, for women's empowerment at the project level. And we felt it very necessary to do this to provide accountability for gender policies in these sectors. I mean, this, while it seems to be new and fresh, this new focus on gender and climate, 
actually we've organizations like Lendas and Wokan and, and many others, not so many others, but there are so many others who've been working in sectors that are related to climate change and not labeling it climate change. Um, but this has been necessary to, to, we think it's necessary now to look for accountability mechanisms. Uh, we built the W plus standard to measure the outcomes, to use an evidence basis to look not just as the inputs and the outputs of activities, but what has happened as a result of those activities. So the W plus standard also allows for not only the measurement, but also the monetization of these outcomes through the creation of uh, W plus credits. These are outcome credits that can be, uh, can be, don't have to be aligned to carbon credits. And that then achieves this high quality carbon credits that are now being pushed within the voluntary carbon market. It also, for us, we found it necessary to incentivize the actors in these climate uh, related sectors to work on gender equality and women's empowerment. It has not been naturally forthcoming. And so we needed to give a bit of a boost to that. And this is a market-based approach to do that. Um, we also made sure within the standard that there's a benefit sharing mechanism because it's market-based. We thought, and this is Wokan's primary goal in establishing the W plus was to find ways to drive new streams of revenue to local women's organizations and collectives who are working within these climate related projects. So the standard requires at least a 20% benefit sharing in the form of a grant that goes to women's organizations to use for their self-determined needs, which are, which are adaptation and resilience related in, in most cases. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeanette. And turning to Sydney. Uh, good morning. I will echo what Beth said, and thank you for hosting this event. This is a really critical topic for our communities, and I'm really excited to see this conversation advance. My name is Sydney Gray. I'm the founding director of Mama Maji. Mama Maji is a nonprofit organization with the mission to empower women to change their world through water. We really work to transition water from one of the biggest barriers facing women globally to an asset for their advancement. Uh, so we specifically target the intersection of women, climate, and business. Over the last decade, we have worked with over 800 women to provide training and support that they need to build sustainable solutions to the challenges they're experiencing in their community. Ultimately, we've worked with them to impact more than 50,000 people. In some communities, this has looked like water companies that leverage productive boreholes to distribute water to communities via kiosks. Most recently, we've been working with women in Maasai land in Southern Kenya to build water and sanitation infrastructure out of an extremely sustainable earthen architecture building method, um, which includes this tank behind me. Uh, by working with this new construction company started and run by women called the Nyasha Majimamas, we've been able to provide water to more than 15,000 people in an area increasingly impacted by droughts as climate change has shifted the rains. While our focus is predominantly focused on working with women to tackle the impact of climate change on water access in their community, land rights are also inextricably tied up in this work. Given that these women are running these businesses, they need to own the land their assets are built onto. Most recently, the Nyasha Majimama has actually built a women's business center because this technology isn't just used for tanks, it can be used to build buildings, any type of structure, including pit latrines. Um, and we've been grappling with how to ensure that the land remains in their name and they don't lose the work that they built in the, in the world that they envision. These women are really building sustainable solutions to climate change in their community. And if we fail to secure the land they're building on, it will fail and their community will suffer from the climate change that is happening to all of us. Thanks so much, Sydney. Thank you all and your organizations for such important work. That will really be a helpful context for the remainder of this conversation. I'd like to take a moment to invite our audience members to start submitting their questions using the chat function. And we'll incorporate as many as we can later on in this discussion. Until then, I do have a couple of questions I'd like to start off with. And I will do this and I'll pose it to you round robin style. My first question is this, based on the work that you do, what is the biggest challenge you've noticed at the intersection of the climate crisis and gender inequality? Moni, I'd like to start with you. Thank you very much. So if I am to explain in one sentence, I would say altogether it actually reinforces the further marginalization of the women and girls. Then how it is 
So we know that climate induced disasters, particularly uproots women from their sources of livelihood, which reinforces the inequalities, eventually broaden the gaps and set them back to the subordinate position. And not only that, women's identity, dignity of life and empowerment strongly tied with the livelihood resources and their productive gender role in and around that field very much matters. So they lose all that. And what is the context of Bangladesh? So Bangladesh has around 80% population in the rural area where their life and livelihood depends on land and agriculture. So as per government statistics, we have more than 70% women in agriculture field with very limited productive resources like land, water, and forest. And they are not officially recognized as farmers, so deprived from easy access to support services like credit, technology, and market. So we can imagine their vulnerable position already there. And what climate change or climate crisis can do. So climate crisis easily can downgrade them to zero level. And we all know that Bangladesh is a Delta country and our down south is surrounded by Bay of Bengal. That is whole water is there. And historically this country is a very disaster prone one. And then due to climate crisis being one of the lowest riparian countries in the world, we experience frequent disasters like cyclone, flood, flash flood, and so on. And results are so inundation, saline intrusion, agriculture is affected, and scarcity of pure drinking water and, and um, environmental degradation. So climate-induced disasters, uh, all these disproportionately impact actually, actually women. And also within the women community, different types of women are differently affected. So they include like indigenous women. They have different issues than women in the rural and single women, elderly, different faith, identity, and classes, all are affected. And they have different, different sufferings. What are those? Sufferings are at different stages during disasters, because when we talk about the climate, uh, climate crisis, we can immediately talk about the disasters the, as a result of climate change and uh, as an effect. And then during what they face, that is different from what they face immediate after and long after. So during cycling, when community, as an example, when community go to the temporary shelter, women's productive health, like maternal care, adolescents, girls, hygiene, overall physical safety and security are serious concerns, which men are not equally separate. And then what happens immediate after? Women are sole responsible to supply food in the table, having empty hands and longer term fall again in the vicious cycle of poverty and disempowerment. Because they are empowered based on land, they are the primary sector labor force, so they are only uh, dependent on that, and that is their comfort zone, that is their only source, what we can say. So, and the manifestation, manifestations are very different and wide range. Uh, some are like low literacy, rate of um, girls, early child marriage, infirmity, and many more. So these are the uh, climate crisis, how it is related with gender inequality. So altogether, what I said in my first sentence, it is further mar marginalization of women and girls, and it widens the gap and fall again into the vicious cycle of subordination position of women. Thank you so much, Moni. Jeanette, how about you? Based on the work that you do, what is the biggest challenge you've noticed at the intersection of the climate crisis and gender inequality? Thanks, Kat. First, I'd like to echo what Moni just said. I mean, I think that there's a now a growing recognition that if we don't address the climate crisis and the gender inequality crisis, um, that they affect each other and they're both uh, equally dire. Um, but I would also like on a positive note to note the time that we're in. Um, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic and, and, and see the opportunities. A year ago, 
we did not have this large discussion and focus on the nexus of gender and climate. And I know because my organization has probably for 10 years been trying to push this boulder up the mountain to get both sides to see uh, the interconnection of these two things. So we're getting also beyond the pervasive narrative that associates women with victimhood when it comes to climate. Um, and I was really pleased to hear uh, uh, Secretary Kerry refer to to get beyond that and to look at women's very active role in the management of forests and agriculture. Uh, but we're still waiting for the recognition, as Moni also says, and the value that's provided to women who are engaged in climate actions and their organizations. Um, this is this would be evidenced by not only listening to advocates. And so it, it takes advocates in the first years to get this into everybody's awareness of the link between the two. But we need now to go beyond the advocacy. We need to fund those who are directly engaged in climate related activities who are bringing about, again, the implementation um, at this nexus. And, and we are very, very, very far from this. People should be screaming from the rooftops that uh, the existing data shows that less than 10% of climate finance flows to the local level, less than 3% of environmental philanthropy supports women's environmental activism, less than 1% of gender equality funding from governments flows to local women and other local and non-local women's organiz organizations. So we're not recognizing, we do a lot of talk about women's leadership, but we're still not recognizing that women have their own organizations that are perhaps best able to, to lead in this way. But I, again, I was talking, the other, I think the other problem is that of silos. Um, again, I was thrilled to hear Secretary Kerry talk about women in forestry. That is very unusual. It's the technical uh, sectors of forestry and energy and others that are still very male dominated. And that wouldn't be a problem, except that there is a very strong bias within those institutions that brings obstacles to women trying to break through their minority positions inside those institutions, which also has an impact in how they relate to communities and organizations that are implementing projects. The other thing I think is that there's a lot of new types of organizations. There's a lot of new private sector organizations jumping onto this bandwagon, which I think is fantastic and it has to happen. But a lot of them don't seem to know how to find those concrete mechanisms to develop and support initiatives that can support both goals. And so I think there's a very strong need to get out there and, and showcase um, some pilots that can do both. Um, and, and particularly, and this is my last point, I think, and this is based on all of Wokan's learning for two decades, is we think there's tremendous untapped potential in women's organizations and women's collectives. Um, and I think there is a, such an incredible lack of uh, attention to this and a lack of funding to this. It's not easy for donors to get funds down to that level, but we need to use innovative financing mechanisms that can support those women and build the enabling environment for them to thrive and support their contributions, which I would like to say are another form of unpaid care labor. We think of that in relation to family and communities, but let's broaden it and to look at women's unpaid care contributions to the environment that brings a global good that is uncompensated in any way. So I think the uh, needs to be attention to how we can fund and in a way compensate them for that care. Um, thanks, Kat. Thanks so much, Jeanette. And certainly anybody that's worked for a nonprofit um, hears you and agrees. Um, thanks so much. Turning to Sydney. Simply put, gender equality for me serves as one of the biggest barriers to locally solving the impacts of climate crisis. While I want to be able to spend all of my time and my focus on working with women to build solutions, to, to build the things that can help address climate change in their community, I'm usually spending an excessive amount of time on building up the women's agency and addressing resistance to their engagement in this work. Um, I've been told by literally hundreds of people, both in the community, but actually usually Western funders, that women cannot run businesses. Um, that they cannot build things, that they cannot be trusted to handle money, that they're too dumb to come up with the solutions and too physically weak to execute on them. 
Um, just last month, we actually had to intervene with a bank that refused to open an account for the women's business because the bank was convinced that the account was fraudulent. And because obviously women wouldn't be able to do this and they were a front for somebody else trying to launder money. Um, when we finally got the account open, they then didn't want to provide a checkbook because the banker believed that the women couldn't handle the money and needed his personal oversight. We had to actually physically go into the bank to help solve this problem for the women so that they could actually do the contracts in the building that they were doing for tanks in their community. Um, we have also grappled with the same issue of land rights. I've been told that women cannot be trusted with the land, that they cannot be allowed to own the land on which they're building things for their families and their communities. These women are brilliant. They know their impacts of their community. They know what resources they have. They're strong and they have innovative and thoughtful ideas for how to solve climate issues that they're grappling with. And Jeanette is right, there has been incremental improvement, but the structure of our world, the structure of our cultures and the things people are doing to try to retain the power that they've had historically, women continue to not be allowed to build the solutions that can help us all rise. Thanks so much, Sydney. You are getting me fired up. <laughs> um, Beth, turning to you. Thanks so much, Kat. Um, I'll, I'll echo things others have said, I'm sure. I, I think the way I would frame the, the central challenge is, is moving fast enough. You know, the, when we look around the world at the support needed to build the foundation for women of secure tenure rights so that they can address the climate crisis, so that they can feed their families, and most fundamentally, so that their human rights are fulfilled. You know, yes, if we if we secure women's land tenure, all of these other effects will follow. Um, there's increasing evidence for that. There's increasing recognition of that. But primarily and fundamentally, this is about women's human rights. And so we just can't move fast enough. Uh, gender equality is something we're not willing to wait for anymore. And, and I think, you know, one of the most exciting things we've seen in the last couple of years is this increasing recognition and momentum in the context of the Generation Equality Forum. So recognition across the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition, across the Economic Justice and Rights Coalition, across the Gender-Based Violence Coalition of the centrality of land rights to empowering women and overcoming the discrimination, the, 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 ways of, the, the ways that women are suffering from inequality. And so there is this real groundswell um, of recognition that women's rights to land and natural resources, women's empowerment in these contexts are fundamental to gender equality overall, are fundamental to addressing the climate crisis. But we're overcoming, and so I, I said, you know, the fundamental challenge is moving fast enough. We are overcoming decades in the land sector of um, land reforms being implemented in accordance with the household model. So assuming that allocating land rights is sufficient for women to have equitable rights or just assumptions that left women out. We're overcoming an enormous data gap on women's land rights. So often we don't even know uh, what, you know, how much land women hold, in what ways do women hold land. Um, I won't go down the rabbit hole there, but anyone who's familiar with the women's land rights sector knows we are trying to overcome an enormous data gap. Um, and then we're overcoming patriarchal norms. We, you know, we've we've heard from Sydney, from Jeanette, from uh, from Moni as well. Um, the challenge is enormous to shift power dynamics toward gender equality, to establish women's full human rights, and to, to shift the beliefs that women have secondary status, to shift the beliefs in what women can't do, to shift to a view that says women can uh, have control over natural resources and should have control over natural resources. And not only should they, but we have better outcomes when they do. Um, and, and we're also trying to overcome decades of these sectors being separate. So Jeanette mentioned this and I was laughing because I, you know, we've seen each other in many forums where we have been beating the drum to say, no, we have to address climate and land rights and gender at the same time. And these are difficult issues, but they are overcomable. They, it, is, it is doable. It's just about the investment that's needed and the speed at which that investment is needed to arrest the climate crisis in particular. We, we all know we have little time. And so I would say that is the number one challenge is seeing 
uh, you know, seeing rural women both as, you know, as in need of this investment because they are primary agents of climate action and also, you know, treating this as a fundamental human rights issue and, and making that uh, the, the primary issue and, and making the investment significant enough. Jeanette, you know, Jeanette quoted the stats on how insignificant the investment is at this point, and we need to, to flip those numbers. Thanks so much, Beth. Um, and that actually brings us to the next question. What opportunities do you envision at this gender climate nexus, including for empowering women and girls and combating the climate crisis? Basically, what strategies have you found effective in making progress towards these goals? Uh, Jeanette, we'll start with you this time. Okay, one, um, go beyond gender mainstreaming. I've been involved in a lot of conversations over the CSW with high level ministers from EU and other places talking about gender mainstreaming. We've been doing that for 20 years. Um, we've got to go, that's necessary, but not sufficient. We've got to go for accountability. We've got to, and that avoids what we're calling pinkwashing. Um, and we have to provide incentive to those behavior, those people whose behaviors generate the desired outcomes. That's what's gonna drive the, the, the needle. These can be women as well as climate project developers, men, uh, consumers, et cetera, one. Two, there's a lot of momentum right now also in the private sector around net zero goals, SDG goals, ESG investing. This has become the requirement for all of those entities. We can criticize them for providing false solutions and allowing false solutions, but we can also make those work for us. Um, and we can use that to address the funding problem as well. Um, how do we turn these to our advantage? We use standards, we use certifications, reporting frameworks. We use voluntary carbon markets. It may sound like a strange thing, but we have a way to look within a project already generating carbon reduction emission units and attach a label onto those that are bringing women's empowerment results at the same time. That's the way we incentivize and those credits with the W plus label are gonna get a higher price on the market, which is currently that market is booming. Women need to be benefiting and engaging in that and not be shying away because it's too technical or complicated. Um, so there's a new opening in voluntary carbon markets for what they call high quality carbon offsets. And high quality is being defined as that that relates to women's empowerment. Boom, there we did it. We, that's a milestone for us and we need to build on that and make that work. And my last point is women's leadership um, and women's organizations. This is, as I said, untapped, huge potential for scaling. We can scale it in two, two ways. We can work within these existing climate projects. We can get them to focus more on women's empowerment and making that central to the way that they're dealing on the ground and implementing those project activities. Two, we could start to support what we would call women climate entrepreneurs. Um, and I would, I would put Sydney in that, in that box. And so these can be not only women-led businesses, but let's think of those collectives and women's groups as well as being um, engaging. Perhaps again, I'm not saying voluntary carbon markets are the answer to everything, but it's this big opportunity that's out there. Um, and this would be one way to do it, but there are so many other ways we can make it work for women and women's organizations. It can be profitable. So we're compensating women for those contributions they're making to the environment, and we're recognizing women as mitigation actors and not just adaptation. And that's because guess where the money is? It's in mitigation. It's wonderful that the U.S. and other governments are putting more money in adaptation. That's necessary. But quite frankly, the big bucks are in mitigation. Why are women not in that space? Thank you. Thanks so much, Jeanette. And Sydney, turning to you, what about opportunities and strategy and effective strategies do you see? I wanna talk specifically about the effective strategies. Because of the role women have been given in our communities, women, especially indigenous women, have deep knowledge of how their community needs to adapt to climate change. What has to happen to be able to adapt to the changing world we're all finding ourselves in. And the more investment that there is in women's empowerment, not just in climate, across every area, the more progress we're gonna to make towards these goals. 
But the problem is that women need support. When we talk about strategies, they need support. They need funding. They need to be given the tools and ongoing support. I'm talking about not over months, not over we're coming into a community and doing a couple workshops, but over years, long-term support and empowerment has been the single most important strategy that I have found is actually effective in working with women to make progress as they're grappling with both the systemic inequalities built into our societies and the problems that they're actually having with climate that keep them from building the world that they want to see. Thanks so much, Sydney. And Beth? Thanks, Kat. Um, in the incredibly beautiful and hopeful climate anthology, All We Can Save, um, to which we'll hear from Alexandria Villasenor later, and she also contributed to this anthology. Um, uh, but the, the climate reporter Kendra Pierre-Lewis wrote uh, an essay entitled Wakanda Doesn't Have Suburbs. And it's, it's talking about the, the fictional um, kingdom of Wakanda in the movie Black Panther. And she's talking about how we need a different story for how we relate to nature. Um, a story that's based on a, a relationship with our environment that is about human thriving and environmental thriving and building both our cities and our, our countryside in a way that, that enables that thriving. Um, that is a, a green future and um, a thriving future. And, and telling that different story is, is really where I see the opportunity and the strategy. And, and that's really what the strategy of Stand for Her Land is. Uh, we're, we're really excited about this campaign. This is um, the Stand for Her Land is a mechanism for getting resources to grassroots women who are doing this work of climate mitigation and adaptation and of securing women's land rights um, across the world. We're building national level coalitions of grassroots actors and empowering and amplifying their voices at the national and regional and international levels and working to build political will to call on governments to fulfill their duties to implement the laws that are already in place and to reform the laws that need to be reformed. And as part of telling that different story and amplifying and accelerating that work of implementing women's land rights, we are calling for a different story about our relationship with the natural world as well. So a story about a story about how women relate to nature and a story that invites and trusts men and boys to act as allies for gender equality. So that says we don't have to have this story of scarcity and conflict that we've lived in that says we need to invest in women and girls we need to invest in the 1 billion women uh, worldwide who live in rural areas in particular and secure their tenure, that that is a broad-based democratic approach that is creating a new ripple-up economy that is the basis for a, a new thriving world where humanity has overcome the climate crisis. And that that is a, a future and a story that we need to commit to and, and be able to believe in. And, and that is really, what we are achieving currently with Stand for Land. And um, I'm, I'm excited to, to turn it over to Moni because she is, she is a part of this movement um, across the world that we're, that we're engaged in. Thanks so much, Beth. Moni, love to hear from you on this as well. Thank you very much. Uh, so we know that worldwide women mostly are the small scale farmers. And not only that, when they do the farming activities, they practice organic use and, and preserve indigenous local variety of seeds, which are very helpful for soil health. And we talk a lot about the sustainable agriculture, sustainable food production. So women are the best example of doing things in their own way. But they need land, they need support. So what's happening in Bangladesh, so we have an issue of women agriculture, they call it worker, actually they are the farmer, which are not officially recognized. So what needs to be done, which would be the best, recognizing the feminization of agriculture, not only in Bangladesh, all over South Asia, and also the accepting the ground reality of having 70%, more than 70% women farmers. So in Bangladesh, those who are very much active, they produce the food stuff, and we know that small farmers all, all together fit the world. So what I believe in and what is evident that land-based empowerment of women and girls through equitable distribution of land, 
uh, whatever it is, private, public, and community land, would make a big difference. So also some studies reveal that once families or rural communities are food secure, they can think of their other needs and can position them in claiming their rights towards living a better life with dignity and peace. So secured land rights, I think, is a key contributory factor towards closing the gender gaps of a big section of women in Bangladesh and many other countries. So here we have some issues. I think there are some others in different countries. We have the issue of accepting universal family core, which is very much long-standing demand from the women community, which can close the gap of inheritance, uh, discriminatory inheritance laws and personal laws, so which are really against women. And gender-sensitive policy laws reforms and full ratification of CEDAW, which is not in Bangladesh, are the legitimate demand, need to be accelerated. And putting women at the center of this uh, center of decision making is a must, whether it is climate crisis or it is land or it is any other employment and right issues. So altogether, I think three things are very crucial. That is more resource investment. So unfortunately, I could not listen to all from John Kerry because internet was very weak at that time. So I, I got to um, them. So there is a commitment for more investment uh, for gender uh, equity and equality. So that would be very helpful. And there need to be political will and commitments from respective governments and relevant sectors and international communities. And from us, I think women's collaborative efforts need to be strengthened. That is very crucial, and hopefully we are uh, striving for that. And stand for her land campaign is one of them, and uh, we are taking it in Bangladesh, and also and we will be trying to close the gap, whatever we have in existence. And we are thankful to U.S. State Department because they are supporting this um, campaign. Thank you. Thank you so much, Moni. I'd just like to know our office is so excited to support Landessa's efforts to advance women's land rights in countries like Colombia and Bangladesh, including through the on-ground partners like ALRD as a part of the Global Stand for Her Land campaign. We are really, really privileged to be able to help support that. Additionally, recognizing the importance of empowering women and girls as climate leaders, my office also launched the Innovation Station initiatives in 2021, which amplifies women-led organizations, including WOCAN and Mama Maji, that are developing translatable solutions to climate-related challenges. The climate crisis is truly an all-hands-on-deck situation, which we know. And that is why it's so important to promote the leadership of women and girls when addressing these challenges. And we're excited to really continue to, po to po provide policy programming and outreach work on the space. And with that, let's move to our first audience question. Um, Sydney, this one is for you. Uh, in your work and experience, how do women's land rights and climate change mitigation and adaptation intersect with gender-based violence? I um, I didn't think I was going to get into the work of gender-based violence because my background has been largely business and then integrated with uh, engineering as I've done more and more water work. But I uh, we deal a lot with gender-based violence. Um, there's a lot of issues with if women are starting to own land, if they're starting to get revenue, if they're starting to own businesses. I'll put it this way. Men are both some of the biggest tools and resources women can have in the community, men that are big advocates and can be really big supporters of the women. They're also sometimes the biggest barrier. Um, and we have to deal a lot of the times with gender-based violence and finding opportunities for women to have space and mediation with their husbands, um, conversations about what it means for them to be paid separately as a part of a business, um, to own land, um, the fact that it is gonna be their land, not necessarily their husband's land, that it is gonna be um, their paycheck, not their father's paycheck. Um, it's a constant and ongoing problem, uh, specifically gender-based violence, because when no other resources are, can be used, when the land cannot be taken, the revenue cannot be taken, usually it's taken out of women's bodies. Um, so we often have to invest also in handling gender-based violence as a part of the program. Um, and it's, it, it is a big issue. It is, it is genuinely a very big issue. Thanks so much, Sydney. 
Moni, the next question is for you. How has the idea of head of household impacted your work in terms of women's land rights and land title titles? Um, and after Moni's response, I'd like to inv uh, invite Beth's also weigh in on this one as well. Yeah, this is a quite issue in Bangladesh. So we have more than 10% women headed households, but uh, it, it is in terms of accessing land. So uh, we have women only have uh, four to five percent uh, agricultural land. So they they don't have actually land in their name. So when they want to access to different facilities, so in many cases they need uh, some collateral to be submitted um, to the authority, and then they face a struggle on this. And also mindset and then uh, values also. Uh, the patriarchal value doesn't recognize women as a uh, women-headed household or the bread earner of the family. So though she is in this field, though practically she is doing stuff, but it is more about mindset and than patriarchy. So I don't know what will be the answer. So this is an issue. We are, uh, we are dealing with the issue and women are um, a bit a, a step forward only I can say that, yes. Thank you so much, Moni. Beth, would you like to chime in here? Sure, thanks, Kat. Um, so the, the head of household concept, you know, relates to what I said much earlier in my concept, right, my comments about um, the land reform models really focusing on uh, the household unit. And, you know, we still see this all around the world, you know, demographic and health health surveys are are increasingly uh, focused on questions that are directed to women. But you know, they there's still there still tends to be a focus on talking to the head of household when a surveyor comes to the to the home. So often there's there's only data on the head of household. Um, there in in terms of titling going to heads of household, that is very very common. Um, one of the and 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 so that that can often in the context of a land reform that can entrench legal rights for men where previously rights may have held been held more equitably under customary systems for women. Uh, one of the, the legal tools that we have found to be very effective for making rights more equitable is actually to push for regulations that just add another name to, to the, the form. Um, so this has worked in, in a couple of states in India where we've just been able to add a line for the woman's name to, to increase the, the incidence of joint titling. Uh, we've also been able to work on regulations that have, that have enshrined joint titling in law. Um, so just pushing back in, in, in sometimes small-ish ways in, the, in legal regimes against that, that head of household model. So there are really good solutions for that from a legal perspective and also a legal literacy perspective. Um, but it is definitely a huge, a huge challenge and something we see um, in a number of countries that we work in. Thanks so much, Beth. As, as someone that works in a bureaucracy, I recognize that small changes in, in anything from forms to other formats can make a huge difference. Jeanette, this next one is for you. One of our audience members noted that gender responsive financial mechanisms, land taxation and sustainable land management interventions are only possible when policy and management processes are themselves gendered responsive. Can you speak a little bit about how you see the situation? Mm, uh, I don't have any specific experience related to taxation or, or that, but yeah, uh, I think it gets back to this idea that the institutions themselves need to be gender responsive. It's not just uh, the policies or what happens at the grassroots level or the community level, but you know these, these kind of um, biases are strongly um, embedded in institutions themselves. Institutions are gendered. I did a whole PhD on this topic. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, but it's sort of hidden. And we have this idea that bureaucracies are neutral and they're not. And so the decisions made uh, about policies for taxes and who makes those decisions are, uh, we have to view those with a gender lens. So I don't have anything specific to say to that, but it, again, it, I think it draws back to the link between institutions and what they do. Okay, thanks so much. And I don't know if any of the other panelists have a perspective on that, Beth. I'll just second what Jeanette said. I'm happy to leave it at that, yeah. All right, great. 
All right, the next question is for Sydney. You alluded to this earlier, but I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more about the importance of engaging indigenous communities in sustainability efforts. I mean, let's talk specifically to the Maasai. Um, the Maasai have been forcibly settled by the Kenyan and Tanzanian governments, historically very pastoralist uh, culture. They used to go back and forth across uh, what is now the Kenyan and Tanzanian border as created by you know, British independence and dividing up the land. Um, and increasingly pastoralist indigenous communities are being given more and more, they're being settled in the worst land areas in terms of climate. They're being settled in places with the least water, with the least resources, with the least infrastructure. Um, they're being given the last choices on things, um, specifically the Maasai. It's, it means it's very arid land that is highly susceptible to climate change. Um, so when we talk about and this, this happens globally, this happens in the US with native communities and the reservations. They've got um, a largely native communities have been put on very arid land in areas that are very affected by climate change with very few resources. So when we talk about indigenous communities, the first ones that are affected are the ones that are the least resourced. When you see the rains change um, because of climate change, the first people affected are the people who don't have the government investment in infrastructure and pipelines and things like that, um, and have the most knowledge about how this is deeply impacting the communities. Um, one of the first climate uh, refugees um, in the U.S. that were replaced were, was a Donc, le premier groupe uh, de réfugiés à cause des changements climatiques. Resources and the most disinvested in. So, are the most knowledgeable. What's coming for the rest of us? Because it's going to come for all of us at this point, and they are the first to knowledge and are seeing what is happening and have the most knowledge about how it can be affected for their own communities, and we can learn from that. Thanks so much, Sydney. Our next question is a bit more big picture, so I'll invite anyone on the panel to chime in with a response. Um, what role have you seen the environment and natural resources play in aggravating conflict? I have a lot of personal thoughts on this, but who would like to? Um, I'm, I'm, well, happy is not the right word, but I can jump in on this. Um, conflict related to natural resources is driving any number of conflicts, uh, or, or conflict is being driven by natural resource scarcity uh, related to water scarcity, related to drought, um, related to conflict between pastoralists and um, farmers. Uh, we see this in any number of countries that we work in and women suffer disproportionately really in any in any context, uh, it, whether it's conflict, whether it's climate change, whether it's poverty, and that is, there's no exception in the context of um, natural resource-based conflict or, or scarcity. Um, so we see this. Hay muchos uh, conflictos por escasez de agua, cuando hay sequía y los, uh, las, las familias enfrentan la pobreza. Hay moyens de subsistance de ces familles et ça provoque également. These gender-based violence, these forms of gender-based violence that are strongly linked to land, um, but are, are often not associated with land in people's minds um, that horrifically violate the rights of women and girls um, take, take a huge spike when, when there is conflict and scarcity related to natural resources. Thanks so much, Beth. Any of our other panelists? Well, let's just talk about water for a second. Um, and then I see Moni uh, unmuted herself. So I'll just make this really short. Um, literally women are, especially in developing contexts, the people that, the women that are, are responsible for collecting water, making sure that has everything. And as the natural resources change, as the climate changes it, those water resources move. And that can mean that they're going and collecting it for longer, which puts them at risk of gender-based violence, which is happening increasingly in areas. Um, you know, we send girls in the early morning before school to go collect water. They're often subject to rape in communities. Um, it also happens where it creates problems of income in the community. So especially in pastoralist um, Kenya with Maasai, when you have droughts and the water pans change, if you can't get the cattle to it, the cattle die off. There's less resources in the family and the home. The girls start getting taken home from school, tend to go into child marriage because the family needs to, to get rid of the resources and try to bring in their own money. Um, and you see that increasing as the natural resources shift, particularly with water, with climate change, it's affecting women first. Thanks so much, Sydney. Moni? 
I just want to share one uh, statistics uh, which happening in Bangladesh. We have the record of uh, violence against women. That is the more than 70% court cases are directly or indirectly related to land conflicts where women are getting targeted and different forms of violence uh, are taking place against them, starting from harassment, physical assault, to rape, everything. That the moon main objective is to evict them, the the marginalized sector from their land, and they target women. Uh, and also for any materialistic gain, they are being targeted. And it is not indifferent in the indigenous community in Bangladesh. Apparently, we know that indigenous women are more stronger. They are the frontier. They are active and very much uh, they have the visibility and front, uh, at the upfront. But uh, this, this, this case is the same. So we, uh, we have different research findings done in the, um, in the hill and plain land indigenous community. So that is also very unfortunate. It is not different for them also. So it is more than 70% women uh, violence against women are taking place um, uh, where the root causes are land. Thank you so much, Moni. Uh, to dovetail off the water context that Sydney just recently noted, Jeanette, can you talk a little bit more about the agricultural side of this conversation? What role do women have in ensuring sustainable land use in farming and agriculture? Thanks, Kat. And also, I would just like to add that the gender-based violence related to forest is also well noted, like water. When women go to collect forests, there's been a lot of incidences of, of rape. It's really sad. Um, agriculture, yeah, we, I mean, I think you guys need to correct um, Secretary Kerry, who said less than 50% of the women of the agriculture force workforce is women. It's far more than that globally. I mean, Moni's using the word 70. I think that's probably more realistic. Um, women are the primary farmers of the world, but in all of our heads, we still we still see the farmer as male and the and his wife as his little helper. We've got to get out of that because that framing and narrative is what impacts all of this. So it, farming is women's world. And when it's subsistence farming, it's 100% women, women's world. So um, they are key. I think he was spot on when he said that. Um, they're doing their best, but we all know they have not the same access to knowledge, uh, to loans, to equipment, and all of those things that are going to be needed to make farmers cl practice climate smart agriculture. It's going to take some shifts in them understanding. A lot of the practices related to organic farming that Moni mentioned are, are the best they could be doing, but there's going to be be new new ways they need to keep track of changing moisture levels and temperature. Um, we've got to bring them up to speed in terms of getting the right knowledge and skills and technical information and ways to use technology that can assist them in that. Thanks so much, Jeanette. Um, Beth, I'd like to give you the final word uh, based upon the work you're doing at Landessa with on the ground partners. What is one piece of advice you'd give to audience members looking to make a difference in the land rights and land use space? Sure. Um, I would say just start with, with learning about the incredible work that um, grassroots organizations are doing. Um, you can learn about that on the Stand for a Land website, um, organizations that ALRD is supporting in Bangladesh and in um, Colombia and the other countries that we're working with for the campaign. Organizations like Mama Maji are doing incredible work. Um, I, think, I think really focusing on the two sides of the coin for climate action. We talk a lot about fossil fuel reduction, absolutely critical. We do need to reduce and eliminate our fossil fuel usage. But this relationship with the environment, this relationship with our one shared planet is crucial and women's control and, and power over natural resources is a crucial element of that. So this combination of gender equality and natural resource management, I would, I would encourage people to invest in that intersection and to learn more about that intersection and especially um, the empowerment of grassroots actors at that intersection. 
Thank you so much, Beth. And I really, what an amazing panel. You are all just amazing and experts. And thank you so much for your time. Once again, I'd like to thank all of our panelists for joining us today and sharing your expertise regarding women's land rights and land use. This has really been truly insightful conversation. And at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce a very special guest to provide a brief reflection on what we have discussed here today. Alexandra Villasenor is co-founder and youth staff coordinator of Earth Uprising, a global organization comprised of youth climate activists demanding a better future for themselves and future generations. We are so proud to have her serve as a public delegate on the U.S. delegation here at CSW 66. Thank you so much for joining us today, Alexandra. The floor, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for having me today. And I echo a lot of what has already been said. I wanted to briefly add to this discussion, however, the youth perspective about why it is so important that we empower women now, because what we do now passes down to the next generation of women. First, we need to break the cycle of women in poverty for my peers in, in my generation. And one of the ways that we can do this is by harnessing and mobilizing the power and passion of the youth. Youth are often hidden and protected, but let me remind you that youth are powerful and persuasive. What we need is adults to seek us out and make space for us in this work and amplify our voices. Youth need to be on the front lines of the movement for gender equal rights of land because this is our future. Lastly, it is important when we are talking about this issue, we need to remember that women are conservationists. So when women hold the rights to land, we understand that we also hold those resources. And instead of, of exploiting ils ont, ils ont droit à cette terre. To solving the climate crisis. And youth are going to do everything we can to get the action we need to solve the climate crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandria. Thank you for your thoughtful words and for the work that you're doing to combat the climate crisis and helping to mobilize and harness the power and passion of the youth. Many, many thanks to you. Before I introduce our closing remarks speaker, I'd like to take a moment to reiterate my gratitude to everyone who has participated in our event today, including Secretary Kerry, our panelists and the audience members who have chosen to join us from all around the world. We thank you all for your dedication to this important work. Now, no one is better positioned to speak to this dedication than our final guest of the day. Gillian Caldwell is the Chief Climate Officer at USAID, a phenomenal partner to the State Department as we work together to advance women's land rights, promote sustainable land use practices, and empower women and girls as climate leaders. Gillian, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. We welcome your final thoughts. Thanks very much, Kat, and to all of you, uh, as you've already said, Kat, you know, really excellent panel. It's always good to learn something from, uh, from a panel. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm so glad the Commission on the Status of Women has made climate a priority theme this year, um, because as has already been indicated, uh, women get hit first and worst when it comes to climate impacts, and yet, they are such powerful leaders and advocates for change and so critical to the solutions uh, that we need. Um, you know, the, the recent um, IPCC report, you know, confirms we're in this decisive decade with an urgent need to dramatically reduce global emissions. And it also raises the alarm regarding existing inequalities around poverty and governance and basic services and underscores that women and the very poor are, 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 are the most vulnerable. And we heard from Secretary Kerry um, talking about how the US government is prioritizing gender responsive climate actions through increased funding and interagency work to empower women and the president's emergency plan for adaptation and resilience or prepare um, where um, USAID will play a leading role in implementation. So I'd love to just share with you what USAID is doing to meet uh, this critical moment in time. Uh, next month, we will be releasing our climate strategy, which will take us through 2030. And many of you may already have had the opportunity to provide input on that strategy, which we released in draft form at the COP in Glasgow. 
And I'm very pleased to say that the uh, strategy is putting women at the center uh, of our work to tackle the climate crisis. Um, Administrator Power is frequently referred to us as a climate agency of late, and by that she means everything that we do is jeopardized by the climate crisis, and yet if we harness the potential of the, the, the critically necessary transition to an entirely different economy built on renewable energy, um, we can really address so many of the inequities for women and for other um, marginalized and oppressed groups. So, um, you know, we have uh, a very central emphasis and core principles in this strategy on equity and inclusion and a special goal identifying the importance of women and empowering women as leaders. We've also set a target of working with a minimum of 40 par partner countries around the world to, to achieve systemic changes that increase the meaningful participation and active leadership of women, youth, and marginalized and underrepresented groups. Um, this is important because while we, uh, in our strategy, will focus on direct action in the areas of mitigation, and adaptation, and climate finance, and empowering indigenous people, and women, and youth, we are also looking at systems changing interventions. What is the enabling environment? What are the policy frameworks that we need to catalyze this um, you know, dramatic shift to a very different future if we're going to stave off the worst consequences of climate change? And as so many people have said in this panel, addressing gender inequality in land and natural resources not only advances women's economic security, it promotes their resilience and adaptive capacity in the communities where we're living. Um, you know, far too many women lack secure rights over the forests and mangroves and peatlands and croplands they depend on for survival. And then that reduces their incentive and ability to conserve and manage those resources and to adopt climate smart agricultural practices and build reliance. So we need to strengthen laws and implementation to address discriminatory gender norms um, uh, so that it isn't so difficult for women to build secure, sustainable futures based on equitable land and resource rights. Um, USAID has been doing this work for many years. We are currently active in 17 countries around the world, working to improve women's tenure security and ensure that they are able to meaningly, meaningfully participate in policymaking, local planning and management, um, and of course, benefit sh uh, sharing process related to land and resource uses, including efforts to sequester carbon. Um, in a number of these countries, of course, we're very proud to be in uh, close partnership with Landessa and, um, you know, really appreciate their critical and ongoing work in this area. Um, we're also committed to scaling the work we're already doing on gender equity through our Gender Equity and Equality Action Fund, which allows us to work with many different stakeholders. Um, we're hoping to increase women's ability to contribute to uh, land use planning and land management and land governance. Um, you know, just by way of one example, we've been working with Liberia to support and implement reforms of their national land laws. Um, but we all know that having good laws on the books isn't enough. Um, laws aren't worth the paper they're written on unless they're enforced. So helping women to exercise those rights in practice requires behavior change and shifts in norms, which can really be challenging. And we heard about that today. So, um, you know, we're helping raise awareness of this new gender equitable framework um, by using facilitation teams that include women and men to communicate the importance of women's participation in local governance committees and to provide them with technical knowledge on land issues. Um, in, in some regions of Liberia, women now account for 43% of the committee members and many have been nominated to serve in leadership positions. You know, people like Patricia Geh, who was elected vice president of the Zor Yolowi Committee, um, you know, she's in a very important area of community managed forests and um, she really feels that um, the support she's now getting will enable her 
to help lead the community to use their forests and resources in a sustainable way so that future generations can too. Um, we're, you know, we're really looking forward to launching this strategy. We haven't been treading water while we've been developing it. Um, we've been very active with interim guidance for our 80 missions around the world and all of our DC based bureaus and um, very much look forward to continuing to partner with many of you and to continuing to learn from you as we um, as we really try to step up our involvement in tackling the decline, uh, the sort of defining crisis of our time and in recognizing the critical importance that women can and must play in ensuring a just and sustainable future. So thank you all so much for coming out today and um, hope you'll be able to enjoy the rest of the Commission on the Status of Women events. It's a really exciting lineup and um, as always, hoping that we can continue to learn and move forward together. Maybe someday we won't need a commission on the status of women because we'll be so far advanced in our rights and our ability to, uh, to exercise our power and potential. Thanks very much and goodbye. <laughs>